Okay, let's get started. Bienvenidos a todos. Bienvenido a todos. Welcome, everyone. My name is Paloma de la Cruz. On behalf of UHC 2030 and the UHC Coordination Group, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this partner call to virtually launch the 2023 UHC Day campaign. For some campaigners, this is your 10th year. Congratulations on 10 years of UHC Day. For others, this will be your first UHC Day. We are thrilled to have you and to see that our important movement continues to grow. And of course, a warm welcome to our distinguished panelists. We will introduce them shortly. Before we get started, I want to make sure that everyone has the instructions for choosing a language channel. The webinar is being recorded and we're pleased to offer simultaneous interpretation in English, French, Spanish, and international sign language. Closed captioning is also available. You can choose the globe and CC buttons at the bottom of the webinar screen to select these options. If you're listening in English, please stay on the original audio channel for now, and we will let you know when it's necessary to switch to the English channel. A big thank you to our interpreters and captioners for their support. UHC Day is Tuesday, December 12th, but the road to UHC Day, it starts now. In fact, it started in September at the UN high-level meeting on universal health coverage. This year's UHC Day is about translating the political declaration from the high-level meeting into tangible actions and progress at the country level. That's where you come in. We need your voice now more than ever. As many of you know, progress towards achieving universal health coverage is far off track. It's time for action. We designed today's call to get you prepared and energized for UHC Day. We'll start with a brief presentation of this year's campaign, we want to make sure that everyone knows the theme, key messages, and campaign resources av available. We will then show a short video highlighting the outcomes of the September high-level meeting on UHC. That will be followed by two panels. The first panel will help us understand the state of UHC advocacy and the way forward for our movement. In the second panel, we'll explore how we can make this year's UHC day count. During both panels, we will take a few audience questions. To ask a question, please click on the Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar. Now I would like to introduce Matthew Rose with GHS. GHS supports the UHC Day Coordination Group in running the campaign. Matt will walk you through the 2023 UHC Day campaign, and we will turn to the outcomes of a high-level meeting, the way forward, and our distinguished panelists. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Paloma. I'm pleased to present you all the toolkit for the 2023 Universal Health Coverage Day campaign. Everything I'm about to tell you and more is available at uhc.org. Please check out the microsite early and often. This is your toolkit. It was developed through a participatory process with members representing different sectors. We hoped that you will adopt it for your local needs and contexts. Let's start with an overview of the campaign. UHC Day is Tuesday, December 12th. As Paloma said, this will be the 10th UHC Day and we need your voice more than ever. As always, a key part of the campaign will take place online. Our main hashtags are hashtag UHC Day, hashtag health for all, and hashtag universal health coverage. Please sure to use those tags so that your voice can be amplified together. The campaign's theme is an important part of UHC Day and was decided by the UHC Day Coordinating Group. Our theme for the 2023 is Health for All, Time for Action. We've heard the commitments and now it's time for action. To quote the Tishu Boizuo from UHC 2030 at the World Health Summit a few days ago, Words on paper don't deliver health services to people. The global monitoring port for UHC was a wake-up call. The report came out just ahead of the high-level meeting in September, and according to the report, half the world's population still lacks access to essential health services, and almost 25% face financial hardships due to out-of-pocket health spending. This is a human rights violation. The time for action is now overdue. It, ha it has been time for action, and we have a long way to go to get back on track to reach Health for All by 2030. Overall, the toolkit, we include suggested social copy for your channels. 
As you see here, we are encouraging everyone to incorporate time for action themes into your messaging. Again, this is all available at uhcday.org. The 2023 campaign has five sub-themes. The sub-themes focus on actions to get us back on track to achieve UHC by 2030. Invest in universal health coverage, strengthen, Health systems, expand primary health care, work across sectors and communities, and promote innovation to reach everyone. Invest in UHC. UHC supports all of the SDGs. UHC reduces poverty and promotes equity. UHC means financial protection so that people don't risk falling into or further into poverty when accessing services. To achieve UHC, we need to invest in a well-trained, well-paid health and care workforce. A reminder for that, this and every one of our sub-themes is that you can use this social media copy alongside additional messaging found at uhcdiet.org. Strengthen health systems. The key message here is that we need to invest in equitable, resilient, health systems based on primary health care. We need to link UHC health with health security to prepare for the next pandemic. Stronger health systems are incredibly important as more people will live with the severe effects of climate change, which is one of the biggest threats to human health. Expand primary care. Primary health care can deliver 90% of essential health services. It is the most important, most inclusive and cost-effective approach to achieving UHC. We need to expand primary health care interventions, including health promotion and disease prevention. That is to respond to people's needs throughout their lives. Work across sectors and communities. We know we need to work across different health priorities, but health is affected by factors outside of the health system too. Therefore, we need to take into account the environmental, social, and economic conditions that affect health as well. That means, by, that means working with people beyond the health sector. It is essential that we work with communities to ensure inclusive and participatory decision-making in health. Promote innovation. This hashtag UHC day let's, urges leaders to prioritize new ways of doing things. Innovation doesn't just mean digital health and health technology, but also innovation in funding and policymaking. To get back on track towards UHC day, we need innovation across the board. Before I wrap up, let me highlight three key resources all UHC Day campaigners need to know about. Again, our website, uhc.org, where you can find this toolkit and many other resources. Translated materials will be available on the website. Please submit your plans for UHC Day so we can share them on our global heat map. This map is always a highlight of UHC Day. The best way to stay on top of everything for UHC Day is to subscribe to the UHC Day updates and stub stacks. You'll have a number of important updates between now and December 12th, and you don't want to miss anything. This includes our presentation on the campaign toolkit. Next up, I would like to introduce a short video that highlights the outcome of September's high-level meeting. As an issue that cuts across every sustainable development goal, health tells us how well we are delivering on our entire 2030 agenda. From ending poverty and tackling climate change to building safe and peaceful societies. An equal chance in life demands equal access to health, yet half of humanity does not have access to essential health services. And the latest data shows that 2 billion people faced financial hardship due to the out-of-pocket health spending, including 344 million people living in extreme poverty. 
These are not simply matters of health. These are fundamental issues of social justice, equity, and human rights. We can and must do better. Ultimately, UHC is a choice, a political choice. But the choice is not just made on paper. It's made in budget decisions. It's made in policy decisions inside and outside the health sector. Most of all, it's made by investing in primary health care, which is the most inclusive, equitable, cost-effective and efficient part to universal health coverage. We need really to strengthen health systems and it's the number one uh, priority and we need not only uh, commitments, we also need investment and budget. This is the largest way to uh, be prepared for a next pandemic. We really need to think out of the box and realign investments and explore innovations and tap other funding sources for health within the government system. For this, we must listen to communities, including children, co-develop solutions and together keep track on progress. We have a choice. Either we are the generation that saves lives and achieves universal health coverage, or we stand by and choose to let tragedy and inequalities continue. Let's care enough to make sure everyone, irrespective of geography or economic status, has access to basic health care. If we care enough, we will find the will and resources to do so. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ileana Montefor, Director of Special Projects for the Global Health Council, who will moderate our two panels. Ileana, over to you for our first panel, which will help us understand the state of UHC advocacy and the way forward for our movement. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, hello, everybody. As Matthew said, my name is Eliana Monteforte. I'm the Director for Special Projects at Global Health Council, um, and I'm also a proud advisory group member of the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism of UHC 2030. I'm very excited to see so many of our uh, civil society engagement mechanism colleagues here that will be speaking today. So very excited to moderate this panel and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm just gonna introduce our first panel quickly. We have Justin Kunin from UHC 2030, Rispa Walumbe from um, AMREF Health Africa, and Mahmoud Al Hamoudi from the International Federation of Medical Students Associations. Before I jump into the questions for our first panel, um, I'd first like to ask our panelists to put on their videos if they have not already. And then I will also remind you all that there is interpretation. Um, I recommend if you need English interpretation to stay on the channel you're in now. And once someone switches to another language, then you will select the English interpretation. Once they are done, then you can switch back to the general interpretation that you had when you logged in. So I'll remind you all when we when we get to that point. Um, so yes, um, as Matthew said, this first panel is all about really understanding where we're at um, with universal health coverage and what our landscape looks like, especially um, since we just came out of the high level meetings on universal health coverage, tuberculosis and pandemic preparedness and response, which are all very cross cutting. So I'd love to hear from Mahmoud first. Um, what do frontline campaigners need to know about the outcomes of the high level meeting? We just saw a great video. Would love to hear your perspective. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Eliana, and hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world. Let me start first by giving a very quick context into the high level meeting. This is the second high level meeting on universal health coverage that we have, and it uh, represents more of a review point to, to the progress made in the past uh, four years of the first a high level uh, meeting. Now, if, if we take a very quick comparison between both high level meetings, this high level meeting concluded to a political declaration that is almost a double the number of pages. Um, nine pages of preamble or introduction compared to four in the previous declaration 
uh, 11 or 10 pages of, of commitment compared to seven in the previous one. I mean, that must mean something big. Um, if we look into the content of the declaration, there is definitely stronger uh, disaggregation of data and acknowledgement of the global burden of disease and on the, the impact of social determinants of health. Uh, there is an acknowledgement of the shortages uh, in the process, the failure in the progress towards universal health coverage, the failure in the spending um, in, in the spending and health financing. However, what is starking is that it's not only a failure of progress, we are still in the same uh, um, gap we were in 2019. Health finances have not progressed by any means ever since. It's literally the same challenges that were quoted in 2019 that are put in 2023 declaration. It's the same struggles regarding the workforce. It's the same struggles regarding the access uh, um, to services. Um, now, Governments do recognize these gaps. Governments recognize the uh, importance of health and the essence of health uh, to communities to sustainable development, recognize the urgency of progressing towards universal health coverage. However, we have not seen that in, in reality. And judging based on the commitments that came about, um, we do not also see that seriousness in terms of translating this acknowledgement of issues into concrete commitments. Um, the political declaration uh, still does not uh, put a big focus on social participation um, and the lack of the how on inclusion, including communities and ensuring no one is left behind is still missing. Um, there is still lack of concrete commitments to financing and scaling of financing. Uh, there is a lot of uh, words, political words used, but there is no indicators whatsoever mentioned. Um, what is important for us, I think, for frontliners to know is that at the end of the day, this is a political process. Uh, it is not necessarily a disappointment, at least for me personally, seeing the outcomes of the process because they need to agree on something. This is politics. Uh, this is the start, or more accurately, this is only the review of the progress on UHC, but what comes next is very important. Uh, the actual action remains on the ground, on the health systems, and this is where our involvement is necessary. Uh, here are the commitments that has been made, the more extensive commitments that has been made in this high-level political forum needs to be translated into concrete national planning so that we can progress towards universal health coverage, actually. Our invo involvement and our voice here is crucial. We have only seven years until 2030. We're failing behind uh, uh, our targets towards reaching universal health coverage for all by 2030. We are 4.5 billion uh, human being behind, and we need to accelerate the progress together. It's time for action and collaborate for all of us uh, to have partnerships uh, as the way forward for the progress towards universal health coverage. And we cannot let health fall behind um, in the progress towards the 2030 agenda among the whole discussion because health is the core of sustainable development. I would say these are the main outcomes and takeaways from the high level the high level meeting. I'm sorry, in a couple of minutes. Back to you, Iriana. Hey. Thank you so much. That was really great and very hopeful. And I think um, I was there as well. And I know there were a lot of people that were very disappointed about what didn't make it into the political declaration, considering all of the advocacy that went into the lead up of the high level meeting. Um, but there's still so much that we can do, regardless of what's in the political declaration or not, there is a huge responsibility that we as civil society at the country, regional and global levels have to do to take what's in the political declaration forward, but also what's not in and really push governments toward that. Um, so that actually is a great segue into our next question. Um, before I go to RISPA, I just am seeing in the chat that Matthew is reminding people that we will have a Q&A session at the end of this panel, but please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box. We will not be looking at the chat box for questions. We're gonna be looking at the Q&A box for questions. So over to RISPA. So RISPA, how can campaigners help translate the political declaration on UHC into concrete commitments in their countries? So now what, what do we do after the high level meeting? 
Thanks, Eliana. Um, and I hope you can hear me. I think for me, it's always important to start with um, the framing, right? And I think Mahmoud did a really good job of what the political declaration really meant. And despite people's different um, perspectives of how they saw the political declaration unfolding, I think it's important for us to understand that um, we're leveraging the momentum behind the political declaration for national regional action. And I think that's what sets us um, that's what sets us forward, especially as campaigners. Um, and that declaration, although it's made on a global stage, it's actually interpreted, translated, and actioned through our regional, national, and local um, platforms. And that's really it. Um, we need to be able to understand that while people were sitting in New York doing that. Um, even the lead up to the sit sitting down in New York to create that political declaration actually started from a lot of the campaigners in this virtual room today. So it's really just carrying forward um, those aspirations, whether they did appear in the declaration or not, it's carrying forward those aspirations um, through our process as, as advocates, as campaigners. And I think another thing I wanted to remind the campaigners here today is that the tenets of UHC still remain the same. The tenets are still based off of those three old gold uh, things that we talk about when we talk about equitable access, financial protection, and quality of services. Those still remain the same. And globally, we are still faced with new challenges. Um, um, we're still faced with the old challenges that we've seen before and also some emerging challenges that we've seen today. Um, so I think the key thing for us to recognize is that um, first and foremost is that despite these things like economic shifts, conflict or climate change, how do we make sure that we're building momentum towards what the political declaration offered? Because it is, as Mahmoud correctly said, it is a political declaration and that means the translation of it really has to come down to political actors in our national, in our national um, context. So the first piece of advice I would love to give people is um, taking from that third sub theme that was introduced by Matthew earlier, it's really around fostering collaboration and working across the divide. And if we are able to bridge those gaps, if we're able to work together, there's a lot of momentum building in maybe other sectors that we don't traditionally work with. So global health security is one of them. And specifically on the continent, we do have the question around um you know, local manufacturing, for instance, right? What does that mean? Do we see anything for, um, it, it, when I talk about what's happening in the African continent, uh, is there any momentum that we can build to advance our issues when it comes to universal health coverage around that? And then I think it's important as I close to say that we're taking a global moment and distilling that into key moments um, in your own context, um, that'll be extremely pivotal. Right, so there are different moments that will occur, and we need to be able to leverage that and take and take power, take charge of that. And I think that we also need to understand that there's a race to 2030. It's now on. We do have seven years, so that means that's actually a political life cycle that we need to be able to leverage. And that means that um, because it's a political um, space, we need to be able to take small incremental steps between now and then to showcase what exactly it means and and showcase that to our leaders. And then finally, as I close, I think it's important for us to look at this from a policy and political perspective that we actually still have time to make to make um, great advancements in universal health coverage. And um, finally, um, how do we make sure that we translate the grassroots level concerns that we are seeing into actionable data? Great. Thank you so much, Rispa. Um, I think what's most important here is a lot of the times our civil society colleagues feel like it's the moment of the high level meetings are what's most important. And yes, that is important. I'm not saying it's not, but what is even more important I think is what's happening at the country and the regional levels. And the advocacy that happened at the country level was critical even more so, I think, in the lead up to the high level meeting than the actual high level meeting. And now the after part, I think, is also really critical. And the work that our regional and country partners are doing is incredibly important. So thank you for stressing that. Um, so another event that happened during the United Nations General Assembly, uh, the week of the high level meetings, was the launch of the Global Monitoring Report. Um, I will just put a plug in here to say that the civil society engagement mechanism did in fact 
write a commentary on the global monitoring report. So perhaps my colleague Laura can put that link in the chat um, for people who want a summary, a very simple summary of what's in the report and also the civil society perspectives of um, the results of those reports. Um, and now I'm gonna transition to our next speaker, uh, Justin. So the global monitoring report says that we're off track in achieving UHC and we've heard this a lot at the very beginning of this webinar also in the video that we saw. So in, what do we need to get us back on track? Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Eliana. Terrific to see everyone. And you're right, and as we've heard from Matthew and others, the Global Monitoring Report really is a wake up call because for too many people in the world, health is a privilege uh, rather than as it should be a right. And we still have 4.5 billion people without access to essential health services and 2 billion people facing financial hardship. And of course, we also have this triple threat now, climate change, conflict, and health emergencies. Um, so in the first part of my response, I can only really re-echo what we've heard from the excellent speakers so far. We've just had a UN high-level meeting on UHC. We're pleased we got a political declaration in the end that was uh, adopted in full by the General Assembly. It didn't look necessarily that we might end up in that place. Um, and there are some good parts of the declaration. There was uh, an emphasis on public financing for UHC driven by primary health care. Uh, there was a reaffirmation of the commitment to gender equality. And there was also an emphasis on vulnerable, vulnerable groups and the need to address the shortage in the health and care workforce. And, and these are all important themes. Uh, what we didn't see, and this is what we need to do differently, is to have clear and concrete and concise commitments from countries around implementation. And what we've heard uh, already is that that's a national priority and needs to happen at a national level and in a national context, uh, and how these declarations are essentially meaningless if they only get discussed in New York and Geneva uh, and don't reach Soweto and Sao Paulo and many other wonderful places. Um, and that's what this UHC Day uh, campaign is about. I might, if I can, highlight two particular threads of the uh, political declaration, but also the work of civil society and others that I think are really important that we emphasize and where we've seen a shift from 2019 and where we might be able to do things differently. The first is around the integration of health security and UHC. For so much of the last four years, since the last high level meeting, there's been a, a narrow focus on health security, even narrow, more narrowly interpreted as protection from emerging infectious diseases. But what COVID-19 made abundantly clear is that you can't have true health security and true emergency preparedness unless you also have strong and resilient and equitable health system. So it's really about building that bridge between emergency preparedness and UHC. And I think we all have to do much better and greater work at that. The second key point, which is receiving a lot more emphasis as it should, is around the institutionalization of social participation, by which we mean uh, formal processes for the engagement of civil society and communities in national health planning. Uh, we see good examples in places like uh, France, like Tunisia, like Thailand, the National Health Assembly, Assembly in Thailand, but it is not the case in all countries. Uh, you may know that there is an upcoming World Health Assembly resolution on social participation, so it was great to have uh, that uh, topic mentioned in the political declaration, but I think that's the second area where civil society can really push. But ultimately, take as your guide the action agenda from the UHC movement, Take as your guide the UHC Global Monitoring Report, which also highlights positive examples of countries that have made strong progress and raise your voices at the country level. We need your loud and vocal engagement with the UHC Day campaign. Congratulations to all of you for what you're doing, but please keep doing it because we need it now more than ever. Thank you so much, Justin, for that really powerful call to action. Um, I will just put another plug in, um, another really great resource for civil society, which many of you have probably seen um, in the lead up to the high level meeting, but there is the action agenda um, for UHC that's from the UHC movement. And there are some really great action oriented calls and messages that civil society can use and continue to use to push governments to make those concrete commitments that Justin mentioned that we were really trying to push for the political declaration. And while yes, there were some concrete commitments that 
were very happy, ended up in the political declaration. Um, there were some that not so were not so strong. And so using those messages and a lot of the information that's in that action agenda, I think will be really useful to our colleagues and just wanted to bring that up. Perhaps we could put a link in the chat for the action agenda as well. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A session. We have been looking at a lot of the questions that have been put in the Q&A box. So thank you again to our participants for your active participation. Um, I, this is a really interesting question, and I, I'm not directing it necessarily at anyone because I think any of you can answer this, but one of the questions is more about learning. What can we learn from 2019 to the 2023 period? So the declaration in 2019 didn't see a lot of implementation, and Justin, you're mentioning that we didn't really see those concrete commitments and action-oriented commitments in the declaration. So what can we learn and do differently this time to see change at the national level? I believe any of you can probably answer this, maybe raise your hand and I can call on you. Go ahead, Rispa. I thought maybe you'd come in. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, Um. so I think, again, just re-emphasizing, and sorry that I trailed off. Um, I think it's really just about um, you know, reaching across the divide. That's going to be really critical for us. Um, right, right now, I think we've seen that um, if you looked at even the declarations across the three the three high level meetings, there was a lot of discussion around things like primary health care and strengthen, strengthened health systems. And that's also what we're calling for. So I, I see I see a lot of um, opportunities for collaboration, but I would also add that we don't only have to collaborate with other health stakeholders. Um, it's going to be important for us to actually look further across the divide into other sectors. And um, I think depending on the key moments you select within your context, it'll be important for you to reach across the divide and select those key moments and identify how you want to frame the conversation um, and how do you want to also showcase this um, to at a national level to the stakeholders that are responsible, the duty bearers, um, because that's going to be quite critical because these duty bearers are also battling with, um, you know, shifts in economies where you're having to challenge um, a lot of the, the traditional ways we've been thinking about um, financing for healthcare, for instance. Um, so that's going to be important for us, um, especially since um, I know within the continent, we're also grappling with debt obligations. What does that mean when we're talking about increasing investments? So I think it's important for us to really reach across the divide and understand and unpack all of these things, because I think that's one of the things that um, politicians and policymakers might use against us if we don't if we if we always work in those silos um they will use one of those other silos to against against us advocating so if we work together i think you're able to craft a more comprehensive story thank you thank you um i will ask you directly mahmoud if do you have any um response at least from the perspective of healthcare workers i mean i think there's a lot to be learned about the gaps there particularly given that you know we've we're going still through a pandemic and we've learned a lot about where our UHC gaps are, particularly related to health healthcare workers. So over to you for your perspectives. Uh, thank you so much, Ileana. I, I would actually emphasize the siloed approach and uh, reflect on the example of the health workforce and, and how it was tackled from the perspective of UHC. Over the past four years, health workforce has been a priority. Uh, has been on the table in terms of discussions related to health decision making. However, it has always been on the table of decision making from the perspective of, of labor migration or from the perspective of, of labor issues and labor investment rather than health investment. And this is where the siloed approach really impacts the progress towards universal health coverage. If we do not see, and I'm taking uh, uh, the health workforce as an example, if we do not see the interconnectedness uh, of health which each, with each and every policy we make in the society. So we, if we do not adopt a health and all policies approach, uh, if we do not progress towards uh, sustainable development with the perspective of integrating health uh, in each aspect, we will definitely not reach out uh, uh, universal health coverage and we will fall behind. And this applies clearly to the example of the health workforce. Because for governments, the main issue is not actually the shortfall, the main issue is that they are investing in the health workforce, but that's not translating into a return on investment. Uh, but then when you think about it from a health perspective, this is also, you do not, this is not the way you tackle health issues. Um, in order to receive that return for investment for you, this is more of a social return for investment. You need to deploy the workforce in a better manner. You need to provide 
the investment efficiently in terms of their working conditions, in terms of their training, um, instead of only looking at the a side of the approach that matters more from a financial perspective or from a labor uh, labor perspective. So this is a critical example on the side of the approach that Risto mentioned, and this really applies to many aspects of uh, the development of health systems. It's always one aspect that is taken into perspective. It's not necessarily that investments have been lacking. There have been investments. Governments would argue they, that they put investments, but that they put it in the right place with a perspective of improving a system rather than one gap or one issue in the system. That is a huge question for us to answer for governments, actually, not only for us to answer, for us to help to hold uh, governments accountable for in the upcoming seven years and learn from the past four years. Wonderful, thank you. And I have to I have to ask you, Justin, the same question. And I, I only say this because you have been part of the UHC 2030 movement from the onset of UHC 2030. You were an advisory group of the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism from the very, very beginning. You're now co-chairing UHC 2030. And I'm really curious to hear from you out of all your years participating in UHC, you know, what, what can we learn and what can we do differently to really make a difference, this, at least in the lead up to the 2027 high level meeting? This this might not be what you and, and others want to hear, but I think my learning of the past four years is this work is actually really hard. And, and you know, we might have had aspirations for strong progress between 2019 and 23, but the reality is that we've had you know, a very serious pandemic. We've had uh, uh, conflict in, in many parts of the world. We've had geopolitics take over, not just the high level meeting on UHC, but all three high level meetings and the, the SDG summit. And sometimes the, the outcome of these processes isn't, isn't in your control. And the fact that we managed to hold the line and not go backwards actually was actually, uh, you know, required a lot of work under the circumstances. So I guess the learning is actually we're playing the long game. And yes, we have set this goal by 2030, but sometimes you just need to hang in there. And I think that's what we're doing now. And uh, circumstances will change in ways that we don't know in the future. And I'm, I'm confident we will make make progress. But but my learning is that if it feels like nothing happening, keep going. What a great message. Thank you so much. Um, so I received another question. So this is um, about the coverage of universal health coverage. So do you think it is a right time to extend UHC monitoring to other diseases? One of such diseases is chronic kidney disease that affects almost 700 million people worldwide and led to 3.2 million deaths only in 2019. Um, any, also it says here a comment um, in the chat was related, raised about palliative care as well. So, um, you know, we did see a really amazing advocacy effort from our um, non-communicable disease community in the lead up to the high level meeting um, on UHC. And I think there is this talk about, you know, what does UHC cover in terms of the diseases that we're monitoring and that we're trying to impact and just curious to hear from any of you um, about whether it's time to start expanding that or not. Um, and yes, I, I can was going to actually Mahmoud, say, you go first. I'll go second. well, yeah, maybe Mahmoud and then we'll go ahead and have Justin. Over to you, Mahmoud. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll probably put on the hat of, of the junior doctor here rather than yes. the, the advocate here. Um, I, I mean, as a junior doctor, what really makes sense for me is not what disease is being covered, is that when a patient enters a clinic, when a patient enters the hospital, when a patient enters the primary healthcare unit, regardless of their disease, they're able to go through at least the preliminary level of screening, the pre preliminary levels of diagnosis, the preliminary levels of treatment before going into secondary and tertiary interventions, regardless of their disease. And for me, once again, from the physician perspective, this represents a critical issue. The fact that UHC has to be divided according to the types of diseases, according to the types of services. And I understand that also plays uh, on, on the aspect of uh, comprehensive packages. But at the end of the day, we cannot silo again health issues. Health issues are interlinked one way or another. There is no one person that enters with only one health issue. They enter with multiple health care issues, health issues, sorry. And if we do not approach the patients with that, with that mentality, we do not approach healthcare with that mentality, we risk leaving uh, 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 different health issues behind. We risk leaving patients behind. And that's a bigger issue than health issues. Over and back. Great. Uh, Justin? 
Yeah, and I would I would follow that up and say, well, it's absolutely the intention of any movement for UHC that we include the full spectrum of diseases, and that includes all kinds of NCDs. And it also includes the full life course from health promotion, prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, palliation. Um, so absolutely, both of both things and many others are included under the umbrella. When it comes to specific monitoring, I mean, there is this SDG 3.8.1, the service uh, delivery uh, SDG with specific, uh, there are sort of trace indicators. I think we have to acknowledge the the challenges and the data limitations that the world currently has. I mean, we have enough difficulty uh, tracking those in those, I think it is 13, 13 indicators. So in terms of tracking global progress, I think we need to be realistic and tracer indicators are chosen, not because they're the only important measures, but because they are uh, a small enough subset that we have a realistic handle of actually being able to measure. In terms of the aspiration for UHC, yes, absolutely, everything is included. Right, and I see Rispa, you have your hand up. Over to you. No, I, and, and I, I think um, Justin and Mahmoud have really framed it quite well. And I think the only thing I wanted to add is looking at um, countries sometimes take small incremental steps towards, you know, expanding that package. And um, there's a lot of effort that goes into even the design of those packages and, and how even those packages, while something might be included in the package, whether it actually translates to service delivered. And I think that's a gap where um, civil society can actually come in and 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 guide on because um it's it's I, I think it's it's yes i completely agree with justin and mahmoud i think the ad, ad, additional thing that we would need to do as civil society and as campaigners is when a package is designed and something is explicitly put in as a as a service or or um a package that someone is entitled to then it's important if someone is not receiving that service and they are entitled to that service that's when civil society need to actually come and voice that because it's great for us to have a long laundry list of 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 things we've put in a package but if people aren't actually receiving that service then we've done a disservice to to the entire community that we represent yeah that's the only addition i had thanks Great point. Well, I would love to continue speaking to you all, but we are actually at time now, and I am going to have to switch to our second panel. But I really want to thank Rispa, Mahmoud, and Justin for uh, this really interesting discussion and allowing us to understand what happened at the high level meeting and where we, what the landscape and universal health coverage looks like now, and um, for your encouraging words for how we can continue to move forward. Um, so now we are going to switch over to panel two, and this is very forward thinking. So now we know where we're at with universal health coverage. Let's think about what we can do in the lead up to UHC Day to really make an impact and to really make a change and to make UHC Day a su success. Um, so I will just start by introducing our speakers. We have Harriot Kosa from the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Darlton John from Health Alert and Leandre Fouy from Apt Associates. Um, I will just say here, Leandre is going to come in speaking French um, when uh, Leandre gives his intervention. Um, so for those of you that need the English translation for that, you'll have to click on the interpretation, the globe button at the bottom of your taskbar and switch to English to listen to the interpretation. And then once um, the intervention is complete, you'll need to switch back to the original setting. Um, if you have any issues, please type it in the chat and my colleagues can help assist. So uh, my first question is gonna go to Harriet. So uh, what are effective approaches for reaching and engaging policymakers at the country level on UHC day? What kind of messages work well and resonate with them? So we've heard from RISPA how important it is to have a lot of mobilization at the country level. So what are your suggestions for that? What works and what doesn't? Over to you. Thank you so much, Ileana. And uh, good evening, everybody from India. So happy to be here. So uh, thank you for this. You know, this is my favorite area to talk about that what should we do, you know, where, while we are working with government and with policymakers, especially in today's world full of political changes, political fragility and restrictive settings. My first word to start the discussion is 
we need to build all our discussions on community intelligence. Nothing without communities being at the epicenter, nothing without actually understanding, co-creating, discussing, planning, and then talking to policymakers. Communities should be at the forefront of taking the battle ahead. <laughs> and when we are doing these discussions, when we are talking, you know, we have to, you know, uh, from South Asian and from global context, equity, resilience, and sustainability. These the, the, these are the bottom lines. We have to build on it. We need to highlight local key policy issues. What are the choices? I think, you know, one of our, uh, when we started discussion, we did mention about the word choice. I think that is very important. We have to put, a, put our pin on that. When we are offering suggestions as uh, activists, as advocates, what has worked in South Asian context is we need to bring out innovations and important methods. What could it be? You know, thank you for highlighting that it's not always only digital healthcare, whereas I think that's very important. We need to push more for it. But what about other models? We need to talk about self-care, putting health in communities' hands. A woman, a young girl who's unable to access SRH services, abortion care, give her a pill. We need that kind of system. But that should not, you know, make a government or government think that, the you know, now they don't have to provide services. It is still government's duty it, because health is, you know, our basic right to demand. Governments and policymakers, you know, these days there is so much discussion on how to fund the system. We need to have more community-led discussions, planning, so that we are able to plan and implement health system reforms. And it has to be based on human rights principles. We need to prioritize as to who is left behind, you know, reach the last mile. As COVID has taught us one thing, you know, it took us a pandemic to teach us all this, but we need to have resilient health systems so that we are able to prioritize access issues. I want to share one example from India. HIV program has been so successful because communities have been co-creating it, planning it. You know, there has been huge discussions as to how do we prioritize full population coverage, service coverage, financial protection to each and every person. Looking at lessons from countries like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, where there has been so much focus and dialogues around raising necessary issues, but not just limiting it at raising, allocating, managing these resources more, like I would say, efficiently and equitably. Also, we need to stand up because restricted environments, you know, we are still um, like yesterday only in India, we had discussions on marriage equality and we are not, we have a long road ahead on that. But when we are talking about abortion rights, rights of LGBTQI communities, women in sex work, transgender women, women who use drugs. South Asia has seen some wins, but the main there is, you know, getting a right, but, you know, implementing it is the last person who wants a service is, you know, is able to actually make a choice that, you know, yes, I want to access this service. We are not even talking about rights. We are not even talking about availability, but is the choice still there? There are some amazing models like, I, I uh, like for Bhutan, for example, the multi-stakeholder task force model that government of Bhutan runs it and manages it. It is so beautiful. We need to have more multi-sectoral dialogues where activists, communities are sitting face to face and negotiating with governments and policymakers that this is something that we need. And how do we do it? Let's think together, you know. Then task shifting, our health systems are so burdened. It's high time. We talk about a lot of task shifting, which Nepal is doing so beautiful. I think all South Asian and other countries need to talk about it. When we are talking about, you know, one thing which I feel is political will, which is reducing and we need to push harder. We need to get more dialects around it. We need policymakers to, you know, understand that, you know, things are changing. We cannot, we talk about UHC, we talk about communities last mile and not talk about countries like Afghanistan and South Asia. I'm not going beyond, beyond South Asia because, you know, we are all burdened mentally and emotionally on those areas. So we need to 
make policymakers understand that we, a country specific national level policy which is able to make a meaningful health system and you know just ensure that no one is left behind the last person mm -hmm. most marginalized community yeah Absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning the importance of civil society really being the center of everything related to UHC. And I know Justin mentioned social participation in the first um, in the first panel. And I just want to reiterate how important it is for governments to engage with civil society because they stand on the front lines of a lot of the UHC gaps and challenges that we see. And they have a lot of the data and a lot of the answers that people at the global and even at the government level don't necessarily have. Um, we talked about the global monitoring report. There's not a lot of if any, disaggregated data in that global monitoring report. So without disaggregated data, how do we know who is being left behind? How do we find out why they're being left behind? Well, a way to find that out is to engage with civil society because they know and they do have that data and they're sitting on the front lines of all of the healthcare issues that we're seeing. And so thank you for putting such a strong focus on civil society being at the center and really having them raise those country issues um, that need to change at the government level or at the country level. So thank you, Haryat. I'm sure we'll be coming back to you with questions. Um, so next we have Leandre. So Leandre, how do we effectively reach and mobilize stakeholders and advocates beyond the health sector to urge actions towards UHC during this UHC day? What messages do we need to do so? And I'm just going to switch right now to the English interpretation. Over to you. Okay. Merci beaucoup pour m'avoir invité à ce forum très intéressant. Je suis Léandre Rongui, je suis spécialiste en financement de la santé à Apt Associates. Je suis en train d'appuyer Madagascar dans la marche vers la politique sanitaire universelle actuellement. Alors, pour votre question, je peux dire que il est important de renforcer le plaidoyer, le plaidoyer pour associer euh, les tous acteurs. Je prends par exemple le ministère de l'économie et des finances qui est euh, le ministère de tutelle qui finance, qui a le budget dont nous avons besoin pour des actions en santé. Il est important de le rallier à notre cause. Il est important également de travailler euh, à associer l'Assemblée nationale qui est l'instance qui travaille à voter les lois, les lois qui entrent en vigueur qui favorise les actions en santé. L'Assemblée nationale pourrait être utilisée également pour rehausser le budget, le budget, bien sûr, que le ministère de l'Économie et des Finances nous offre. Donc, il est important de travailler, de faire des pédoyers, de trouver des cadres de concertation pour associer ces acteurs. Je prends également les autres secteurs ministériels. Par exemple, si je prends le ministère de l'Agriculture, le ministère de l'Agriculture, dont les actions on sont en arrimage ou impact d'une manière ou d'une autre les actions en santé. Si je prends par exemple euh, les, les pesticides qui sont utilisés, si les pesticides qui sont utilisés ne sont pas de bonne qualité, ça pourrait in, a, impacter les indicateurs de santé. Donc il est important de travailler avec eux pour que lorsque nous travaillons, eux aussi ils puissent travailler à améliorer également les interventions pour favoriser et alors les interventions que nous menons en santé. Je prends le ministère de l'Environnement. Le ministère, de, nous travaillons dans un environnement et l'environnement dans lequel nous travaillons a un impact nécessairement sur la santé. Donc, l'environnement, les indicateurs de santé sont en lien avec les actions de l'environnement. Il est important de rallier ces acteurs à notre cause. Et je vais prendre un, un dernier exemple, la sécurité. Lorsque les prestataires doivent donner des services de santé dans les centres de santé, il est important qu'ils travaillent dans un environnement sécurisé. Donc, le ministère de l'Intérieur de la sécurité est également un acteur que nous pouvons associer, rallier à notre cause. Ces acteurs, tous les actions impactent d'une manière ou d'une autre la santé. Donc, il est important de trouver des cadres de concertation, de dialogue, de discussion pour les rallier à notre cause pour que nous puissions marcher dans la même direction pour la marche vers la couverture sanitaire universelle. Et le mot d'ordre, nul ne serait de trop pour la marche vers la couverture sanitaire universelle. Merci. Thank you so much. I am just going to switch back to my original audio. Okay, great. Thank you. I think it's really critical for us to understand. And again, it's this siloed approach that we often take where we're just thinking about health 
and we're not looking at all of the other sectors that impact health or that health impacts. Um, and even when we talk about um, investing in healthcare, for example, a lot of the times we see our civil society or our other stakeholders and colleagues that are only focusing on targeting the Ministry of Health for, or the Ministry of Finance, for example. But when you're trying to increase health investments, it impacts other sectors as well. And it's important to incorporate the finance departments of all the other sectors too in this conversation. And so I love your examples of you know, how health is connected to so many of these other sectors. And I think when we think about asking governments to increase investment in health, we have to think about it in that way too, how it impacts other sectors and how other sectors have to be a part of the conversation for us to achieve those um, investment goals. So thank you, Leandre, and we'll probably again come back to you with some questions. Um, so now I will move over to Darleton and you, uh, I can see you on the video, you're a little bit dark, you look a little bit like a shadow, but that's okay, as long as I can hear you, that's what's important. So Darleton, how can, how do we leverage and build synergies between the UHC Day campaign and the COP Climate Conference, which is taking place around the same time? Um, and I'm really happy that we have this climate change question here because during the UN General Assembly, uh, during the week of the high level meetings, there were actually a lot of side sessions, informal side sessions about how climate change impacts health and vice versa. So over to you with your insights on that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, good evening, uh, India, and uh, the good afternoon or good morning somewhere else. Um, so I, I'm very excited. You know, I, I want to say, first of all, that um, uh, most of the contribution that has been made. Uh, I've been enthused by a lot of the contributions and um, I think the, the spurs in certain direction. Um, however, somebody said something that, that how do we translate? How do we translate these high level issues? How do we translate them? And for which, when we talk around UHC and we, we are talking around climate change as it is, for us in our context here locally, these are high end because uh, we want to see the situation that most times when, when our leaders go to these meetings and they come back, by the time they, they board the flight and coming back home, uh, in, for instance, West Africa, yeah, where we reside, um, it, it's as if they forget about all these things, localizing these issues, this agenda. And so it, 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 it's sometimes very, very tough for us to build this synergy, as my brother just said. We talk about UHC. Most times we just look at maybe the health implication directly, I mean, the disease control and that kind of a thing. But the, how do UHC connect to other issues? How do we um, make sure that we build that synergy and leverage on the opportunity that we are, that, that are existing uh, around us? So we talk about the COP28 um, 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 climate meeting that will be coming up in November, as you said, and, and ending in, 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 in December 12th, when, once the UHC um, 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 will be starting. These are moments, these are advocacy moments that we can look at the issues. For instance, the theme of these two activities are, is like the events itself is conspiring, that we need to take action. For a couple, they are saying a major cause of correction. They want to see a proper shifting. What are the issues of climate change? How do we impact them? Our youths, uh, for, for instance, in Sierra Leone, our context, uh, we have a, a very youthful population, over 53% of the, of, of the population are youth, and they are involved in certain um, um, amenities that do not provide for the environment itself. We, we involve in sort of uh, um, uh, illegal um, mining, using hazardous chemicals in those mining communities. And they infect uh, uh, our waters, our, our uh, marine reserves, as the case may be. For Sierra Leone right now, we're having a serious challenge. Our coastal line, every two weeks, we have these seaweeds that, that take up all the coastal line. And it is becoming, it becoming very en environmental unfriendly for several people, for several communities, and it is contributing to so a lot of financial financial hardship and burden to those communities that they are affect, that they are affecting so and and they have health implication we we talk about greenhouse emission 
I mean, during uh, um, the COP27, they were talking about how do they compensate countries so that we we are able to build um, um, or grow forests that will be able to reduce those emissions. And these are real things. We we look at our, in our hospitals. We have a serious respiratory situation right now in Sierra Leone as we're speaking. And one may want to say, ah, well, they have no connection, but these are the realities. Climate change is con com uh, uh, continues to, to create a lot of problem with our health securities, as the case may be. Sierra Leone, as it is, is, is high rated in, 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 in the, the ladder of, of countries that are prone to disasters. As the case may be, as you know, we had Ebola a couple of years ago, and of course, uh, we are talking about the COVID-19 context. These are all issues that we can look at, and together we build um, activities and initiatives that could help us to produce and help us to inform our constituent members. We talk about financing to, to this commitment. These are very critical issues. So we are talking about committing monies to issues around climate change, reducing emission. How do we use those finances to ensure that we connect them with local issues, local uh, um, agendas, local initiatives that could be able to drive change within our local context? Because sometimes we talk EHC, that is on the big broader concept, but it is right to help a young woman that is disabled and is physically, she's physically challenged goes to a community for health to require health services, and she's denied. At the end of the day, she dies. She lost the baby, and she dies. These are all the critical issues that we have to look at and see how do we connect them to ensure that at the end of the day, we are able to push forward. But definitely, I think these are advocacy moments that we could leverage on. There are a lot of opportunities. How do we bring the youth very, very critical to build those initiatives and build those ideas and take this process forward? I think for, for now, those are some of the highlights that I would like to share with, with, with us. Great, thank you. Um, I think you know what I'm hearing is really critical here is linking health to climate change. And a lot of the way that we do that and the way that we can show that is by using data. And a lot of that data does exist, but we need to put it on the forefront of our leaders and our government officials so that they can really see that link. Um, at Global Health Council, we do a lot of global health advocacy um, in Congress. And a lot of what we hear in Congress is we want to see the data. We want to see the data. We want to see that concrete information that really shows where that need is. Um, and so that's really critical, I think, when we're talking about how do we link climate change to health. And I think that there's a lot of information. Um, and I learned a lot from the different side sessions at the UN General Assembly that really provided a lot of that information about how the climate can really impact health. And so um, I think when you're working at the at the national and regional level, really think about how do we present digestible data um, to our governments and our leaders um, so that they can really see the problem and act on it. Um, and I love that you mentioned youth because youth is very much involved, I think, in the climate change movement and really critical, you know, when we're talking about social participation and civil society engagement, that means youth too. And they're involved very much um, in the advocacy that uh, we do around a lot of these health, health issues in UHC. So thank you for mentioning youth as well. Um, so now I'm going to transition to um, some questions and I'm gonna actually direct this question first to Hari Jot, but I do want other uh, panelists to come in if you have an answer. Um, but Hari Jot, since you spoke a lot about um, mobilization at the country level, we did have a question on um, how can we support stronger alliances and coalitions at the national levels uh, to promote more unified calls, whether it be for investment in health or any other UHC health uh, issue or challenge that we're seeing. Um, I think there's a lot of coalitions and a lot of networks that exist at the regional and country level and what can we do to work and, and support them? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And uh, see, one thing which I have learned from HIV and TB program is that when we are getting into coalitions, you know, and uh, when we have networks, they always propel, you know, they help voices. They are the, they are the ones who are actually, you know, making things happen with policymakers. But one or two things which I feel is that the, the restrictive environments are something that, you know, we really need to start 
uh, from the justice part, if you know, if we are talking about it, that you know, we want to get equity, but how do we weave the process? How do civil societies support each other? How do we also get evidences to push our discussion? And these evidences could be, you know, qualitative, not always quantitative, because government, uh, you know, data is in hands of at times at in country level with governments and bigger organizations and networks don't have access. So we need to get voices, stories from the field, get it out. Social media is going, you know, it's is a boom, is a boon, I should say, boom also and boon also. You know, use it to maximize. I have seen so many issues when it comes to um, female genital circumcision or mutation, you know, in Maldives. No one is talking about it, but on social media, networks are going you know, crazy. And it is actually getting some voices. Issues of single male migrants in PNG or Maldives or in Bangladesh. These issues, governments are not talking. There are smaller networks, but how are they amplifying the voices and getting investments is through social media. I think we need to harp on that platform and work and support each other. Yeah. Great responses. Thank you. Um, I am going to ask, perhaps, Leandre, you spoke about you know, connecting all of the different sectors. Um, I'm sure that there are various coalitions that either work in agriculture or work in, um, you know, economies, things like that. What, what can we do to ensure, or what can civil society or advocates do to ensure that there is that, um, that working across sectors, that we come together across sectors and we advocate together across sectors um, especially if we're not seeing that it's happening necessarily at the government level, what can we do as advocates in civil society to almost model that in our advocacy? Leandre, just over to you. And for those of you who need interpretation, just a reminder to switch to English. Oui. Alors, merci pour cette uh, belle question. Euh, pour l'expérience que j'ai eu à, à réaliser au Bénin, euh, il faut dire que les organisations de la société civile, il y en a qui travaillent aussi bien dans la santé que dans d'autres secteurs. Ils ont peut-être la santé, l'environnement. Donc, il y a quand même une interaction entre les OSC. Nous avons collaboré avec les OSC qui ont, été, qui ont joué le rôle de transmission pour toucher les OSC de la culture, de l'environnement, qui sont entièrement dans, la, dans, dans les dans les dans l'environnement et la de la culture, les organisations de la société civile. Nous avons fait une réunion, et nous avons mis en place un cadre de concertation où les ministères ont commencé. On a invité les ministères, le, le ministère de l'environnement était un représentant, et de fil en aiguille, nous avons pu rallier les autres acteurs autour d'une table où nous avons échangé et présenté les actions que nous avons, par exemple la santé, et montrer comment est-ce que les indicateurs pour l'environnement et autres pourraient impacter. Au début, ça a flotté un peu parce que pour les réunions, ils ne venaient pas toujours, parce que ce n'est pas directement leurs actions, mais par la suite, ça a pris. Et tous les acteurs que nous attendons viennent, ils arrivent à, à s'asseoir autour d'une table et nous discutons, et tout ce qui est action que chaque secteur pourrait faire pour contribuer à la santé, ils le savent. Et donc, ils intègrent ces actions-là dans leur plan d'action pour la mise en œuvre, ce qui pourrait améliorer les indicateurs de santé. Donc voilà une expérience que nous avons, que je partage avec vous, que nous avons eu à faire au Bénin. Thank you so much for that country example. I think it's really key to have uh, good country examples that civil society can use in their own country contexts. Obviously, adapting it to um, their countries, but always important to, to really see for real and in concrete terms um, how this can be done. Um, Darleton, did you want to come in? Otherwise, we can um, move to the next question. Okay. Um, okay, so for the next question, oh, did you want to say something, Darleton? I think I just saw your... Okay, great. So let's move on to, to the next question. So um, a lot of our civil society colleagues really want to hear about plans in the lead up to the other high level meeting on universal health coverage. And also just thinking about 
you know, plans for advocacy um, in the lead up to our 2030 goal. So um, it would be really interesting since you all are really coming in with such great country level examples to hear from you all on what you all are planning to do um, in your work at the country level um, in the lead up to a lot of these moments that we've been hearing about. I mean, it's not just the 2030 goal, it's not just the next high level meeting, but you know, we have the World Health Assemblies in between and other UN General Assemblies in between and so many other regional and, and national opportunities for us to do our advocacy. So I would love to hear from um, one or maybe all of you just quickly on you know, what, what your plans are for um, moving all of what we've been talking about forward in UHC. Um, Darleton, I see you've unmuted. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Ellen. So, so for us, as I'm speaking to you at the background as where I'm right now, we are the second country in West Africa that will, uh, pilot has been piloting the UHPR, uh, that's the preparedness review process, uh, where we are looking at how our country is faring on with regards to uh, vital health coverage as it is, and then how much we are prepared. And as, as we, just like what we've highlighted here, the UHC in itself, you know, and I, I liked the, the suggestion that came out that we, we cannot continue to box ourselves in one corner that we say we cherry picked certain uh, intervention, you know, like issues like uh, non communicable diseases. How much has it been at front line? People are dying. Um, um, uh, hypertension is one of the leading cause of death in the world as it is right now. It's the CEOs. People are not talking about these things, so to speak. So it, these are issues. Uh, that we continue to evolve and we continue to discuss. And also the idea of understanding what is UHC at the local level, that is, has been the greatest gap for many countries in the world. It has been the greatest gap because you go to certain communities and you, you're talking around this issue. Nobody tends to understand. And even sometimes at certain of our authorities at certain higher level to actually demystify and sort of like um, make people understand what are the benefits, what are the importance of you being part of this process? I mean, it's very difficult for us to understand. For us, for us as civil society, we believe that firstly, it is very important that we bring the knowledge and understanding to the local, the grassroots people. And I want to agree with my sister from, from, from India. This is, we cannot go anywhere around it. In Sierra Leone, and 95% of our primary healthcare is based at the at the local level, the community level, the list level. And we have over 1,000 450 um, um, healthcare facilities, which are primary healthcare, what we call community health centers. And that, that is the, the first place to go. So if we are not able to translate these policies, this political commitment at that level to the local level, it becomes a challenge. So until we get it right. And so what one of the things that we'll be doing is to how do we continue to, to advocate and reach the unreached, the last mile, um, um, to ensure that they understand the issues and also our healthcare providers, which are very critical and other um, 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 institutions, like for instance, the private sectors has been marginalized in certain areas when you come to health talk in our issues of climate change. They are marginalized, they are not interested. But we do believe PPP, private partnership, bring them together, we all sit together, like my brother said there, we sit and we discuss so that they too understand, so that they understand the value for which they must in, get involved in this process because at the end of the day, it is their children. You are not just working for a, a conglomerate or an institution, but it, it trickles down to your cousin at the village, your cousin at certain communities that might need right. this particular healthcare service such that it, it, it gets to them. So basically, I think for us, I, I don't want to take everything off that I can give <laughs> to my colleagues to, 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 to share I... the lights. No, I really appreciate your very enthusiastic comments. And unfortunately, I am just getting pinged that we are actually at time. So um, I'm very, very happy that we got to hear uh, about your activities, Dalton. And I'm sorry, Harijat and Landre, for not being able to go over to you. But we do have to uh, respect time and start coming to a close. I just want to thank the panelists so much, Darleton, Harijat, and Leandre, for your amazing inputs, especially your perspectives from the country level. As I said, having those concrete examples are so key. And I'm just going to hand it over to Paloma so that she can close uh, the session. Paloma, over to you. Thank you so much, Eliana, and thank you, everyone, for your participation. I, I want to join Eliana in, in thanking the panelists and uh, thank you as well for being such a wonderful moderator and helping us get so much out of today's discussion. 
Uh, of course, a huge thanks as well to all of the people behind the scenes who made today's call possible. Please don't forget to visit uhcday.org to access the campaign toolkit, sign up for updates, and submit your UHC activities for the global heat map. A recording of this call will be available in the coming days, so please feel free to share that with your networks too. On behalf of UHC 2030 and the UHC Day Coordination Group, I want to thank you again for joining us today and for your commitment to universal health coverage. Let's continue to play the long game and make this 10th UHC day the best yet. It's time for action. Take care and see you soon, everyone. Thank you, everybody.